Well, good morning once again. We are here in our second to last week of our series, Victory, Life After the Resurrection. We've been journeying these handful of weeks through these stories of Jesus' appearances after his resurrection, but before he ascends into heaven. And so today we're going to be looking at one more instance of Jesus appearing to his disciples following his resurrection. And this is an important instance because it's one of Matthew's, it's Matthew's last recorded instance of Jesus' appearance to the disciples, which gives us some profound words to live by. But before we jump in together today, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word and thank you for Matthew's faithfulness to write down what you instructed him to write. Lord, we thank you that you have sustained your word all these years so that we could gather together today. Open up your word and read what you have to teach us, Lord. So, Father, may you soften our hearts. May you give us open ears to hear what you have to say. Lord, may nothing that I say get in the way of what you wish to declare to each one of us this morning. But may we be attentive and in tune to your spirit, guiding us and teaching us today. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, D. Elton Trueblood once stated that evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained men, but is instead the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. I was thinking about this quote this week and the struggle with evangelism for many who profess faith in Jesus Christ, myself included. Evangelism is a challenge for most people. There's a discomfort with the idea of sharing our faith about Jesus sometimes. I remember when I was a kid, my neighbor, Matt, wasn't a Christian, and we were pretty good friends, and I spent a lot of time over at his house. And one day I remember thinking, I need to share with Matt about Jesus. He knows that I go to church, he knows that I am a Christian, but he needs to know about who Jesus is. And so I worked up the courage to tell him, about why I believed in Jesus, about the hope that I had in Christ. And Matt prayed a prayer asking Jesus to come and be his Lord and Savior. Now, I didn't follow the rest of Matt's journey to know what the end result of that was because he moved away shortly after. But it made me think about this and ask the question, why do we get so nervous about sharing Jesus with others? Why do we sometimes allow ourselves to be so easily persuaded against sharing Jesus with others? I've had times in my life when I've been more prone to share Christ, and I've had times when I use the excuse of, I'm not gifted as an evangelist. That's other people's gifts. Because there are some people who are just naturally really gifted at sharing their faith. And yet, that doesn't exclude the rest of us from the call that we have upon our lives to also share Jesus. I think part of why there's a discomfort sometimes around this is because there's a risk for us. When we're asking people to come and follow Jesus, there is a cost to their lives. Even though it is the best decision they could ever make, it requires something of someone to humble themselves before Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so there's a difference in what we're asking someone to do, what we're encouraging someone to do, than if we're simply selling them a product or an item. Well, this morning's text, as we look at the Gospel of Matthew, is the last written words of Jesus in this Gospel after his resurrection and right before his ascension to heaven. The final words that Jesus gives to his disciples in order to sustain them, in order to challenge them and exhort them in their new life following the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And these words, as we examine them, I believe will give us victory over any other power. So let's take a look today and see how these apply to our journey of being disciples who seek to evangelize others towards Jesus. If you would turn with me to Matthew 28, we're going to be reading verses 16 through 20 this morning. You can follow along on the screen or grab a pew Bible however you want to, but starting in Matthew 28, verse 16. This is what the text tells us. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So the disciples have journeyed away from Jerusalem after Jesus' crucifixion. They've gone on this journey moving north from Jerusalem to Galilee. Galilee was part of what is northern Israel, and it was one of the three provinces of ancient Palestine. 
The site where most of Jesus' ministry took place was Galilee. It's about a three to five day walk from Jerusalem, depending on which route you take and depending on how fast of a walker you are. But we see here in the text that this is where the disciples go to. And we see right away that there are only 11. It reminds us that one disciple is no longer with the group. One disciple chose to betray Jesus, chose to ignore the teachings he had received and the loving care that Jesus had shown him and is no longer with the group. They are not the full 12 that they once were. And yet these 11 disciples are still following after Jesus. And so they head to Galilee, and they go to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, I was doing some research on this because it's kind of vague. It just says the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. But many scholars believe that this was Mount Arbel, which overlooks the Sea of Galilee. And you can go online and you can watch videos of it. It's pretty cool where this mountain is situated. It's right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And from the top of this mountain, you can see all of the shore of that bottom part of the Sea of Galilee. You can see many of the spots where Jesus had done his ministry, where Jesus had performed miracles, where he had cast out demons, where he had fed the 5,000. You can see it all from this mountaintop. And this is one of the tallest mountains near the Sea of Galilee, and it's where Jesus tells the disciples to go. It's where he directs them that they are to go at this time. And one of the things that I noticed when I thought about the disciples following this instruction to go to Galilee and to go to this mountain is once again the obedience of these 11 men. They've spent the last three years learning from Jesus. He was their rabbi. He was their teacher. They were trying to learn his way as their way of life. The intention of one who follows a rabbi is that they would become like him. But in order for this to come to fruition, in order to become like your rabbi, you must first and foremost be obedient to your rabbi. And the disciples are obedient to Jesus, which is a good thing because that's one of the instructions that we receive throughout Scripture time and time again is the importance of obedience. The disciples put this into practice, and we see many times in Scripture where it calls out the importance of obeying God and His Word. Ezekiel 20, 19 says, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And James 4, 7 states, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That element of submitting oneself comes with obedience that in order to obey someone's commands, you have to submit yourself to their commands. The disciples show in these opening verses their obedience to Jesus, which is a necessity if one wants to be a disciple of his. Well, the disciples have seen Jesus before. We've looked at some of these instances, and yet often they respond with initial fear when Jesus arrives after his resurrection. But this time, we see them respond in a more fitting manner. Look at verse 17 with me. Chapter 28, verse 17 says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. I appreciate the honesty that we find in this verse. The disciples have gathered on top of this mountain, and when they see Jesus, the response of most of them is to worship him. This idea of worship, when you look up the Greek word that's used here by Matthew, it means properly to kiss the ground while prostrating oneself before a superior. To worship is to fall down, to prostrate oneself, to adore on one's knee. There is a real, tangible, physical act that the disciples are putting into place as they see Jesus here. They've seen the risen Christ multiple times, and yet once again, here he is before them. And their response is not apathy or even curiosity of what's next, but their first response is to worship him to fall prostrate on the ground before Christ, made me question, do I worship the Lord in that way? How often do I fall prostrate before Him and worship Him because He is holy? How how much more often do I need to do this? And the reverence and respect that comes with placing yourself in that position of worshiping the Lord. Well, in this verse, we also see that some doubted. I appreciate the honesty and the reality that Matthew brings into this verse. 
That even though they worship him, that there are some who are still wrestling, who are still struggling. And we've seen it before with Thomas when he was doubting that Christ had risen. We don't know who it is who doubts in this moment, who still isn't fully given over to the belief that this is Jesus, but doesn't change Jesus' instructions. That's what I appreciate about what we're going to see moving forward is Jesus doesn't say, well, for those who are believing wholeheartedly, here is your task. But for those of you who are doubting, you have a different task. Or you're not a part of this. But Jesus gives the same instructions to all 11 disciples, even though we see that some doubted. You see, having some doubt in the midst of faith as well doesn't prohibit us from continuing to seek after Jesus, continuing to follow him. Far too often I see people who allow a little bit of doubt to persuade them away from any faith that they had. They think that they have to have 100% faith in order to follow Jesus. And yet we see throughout Scripture there are times that people question. There are times that people go to Jesus and wonder, are you really who you say you are? Where there's slivers of doubt mixed in with their faith, and yet Jesus continues to use them, continues to show himself to them, and doesn't criticize them for asking those questions, but seeks to move them further along in their journey of believing in him and placing their faith in him. Well, Jesus continues in verse 18. He tells us, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Within our text this morning, we're going to see that there are four alls that are used in the text. And the first one comes here in verse 18 as Jesus declares that all authority was given to him. Now, not just authority on earth, but authority in heaven and on earth. The teacher of the disciples here is revealed as the Lord of all. The power that we've seen throughout the life of Christ, his ability to cast out demons, his ability to walk on water, to work miracles, to know the hearts of men and women, is now given the weight behind it that he could accomplish these things because he has all authority on heaven and on earth. And if Jesus were not the Son of God with this authority, then his charge to the disciples would have little weight to it. His exhortation to call them forward in their lives wouldn't have the weight that it does. But because he has all power and authority, it has a significant weight behind it. And the authority that Jesus possesses, you may wonder, but who's given it to him? By who does he have this authority? Well, God the Father has given it to him. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 tells us, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And John 3, 35 tells us, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. You see, Jesus, with all the authority given to him, is authorized to act. Not just to enjoy holding the power to act, but to actually institute his rule and his authority on heaven and on earth. And in his authority, Jesus has the same authority as God the Father. So when we read in Scripture statements about what God can do, about God's character and what he is able to do, Jesus possesses that same ability, the same power and might that God the Father has as well. And as followers of Jesus, this should give us a significant hope It should give us a significant hope-filled prayers as we go before Jesus. That if he possesses all authority in heaven and on earth, then there is nothing off limits to his power and to his authority. It should give us an increase in faith when we petition him in prayer. When we ask him things like, Lord, remove their hard heart. Or Lord, break down those walls. Or draw that person to you, Lord or protect our loved ones, that he has the authority and the power to do that. He has all authority. John Piper, in talking about the hope that we have in prayer because of this, states, that's the way we pray because Jesus is sovereign and has the right to do just that. Oh, may God unleash in your heart and family and church a great spirit of bold and confident prayers to the all-sovereign Christ for the people of the world. See, Jesus is not limited in his authority and his power and his might. 
There is no one who is holding him back or who has given him only partial authority. There's nothing off limits to his power. But he has all the power and authority on heaven and on earth. And that plays a part into what Jesus is about to call his disciples to do. About what he calls us as his followers to do, knowing that he has the authority to do this, to see it forward. If Jesus has all authority, the question is, what does he desire for his disciples to do? In light of his authority, how do we respond? Well, look with me at verse 19 and we'll see his instructions for the disciples. He tells them in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus sends out his disciples telling them to go. This is a word of action, a word that requires a forward movement for the disciples. He calls them out of their comfort zone to go out into the world, not for their own sake, not for their own glory, but in order to impact the lives of others for the kingdom of God. And we've seen Jesus already send out people multiple times in Scripture. In Luke 9, he sends out the 12 apostles. And in Luke 10, we see Jesus send out the 72 in order that they can go and carry the message of Christ to the world. You see, part of the calling of a disciple of Jesus is that we would go. That we would be in the world in order to show people the hope of Jesus Christ. It's hard to show people the hope that we have in Christ if we aren't ever around them, if we've just pulled ourselves away from them and hidden behind our own doors. In Mark 16, 15 through 16, the Great Commission is worded this way. Mark says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I'm reminded of Jesus' interaction with the disciples in John 20, where he tells them, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You see, our mission in following Jesus includes an aspect of going out into the world rather than allowing ourselves to become inward focused. It can be easy to think about ourselves In fact, we live in a culture that the message predominantly this day and age is that you should just think about yourself, that it's okay to be selfish, it's okay to pursue what you want above everything else. And yet the message of Christ is completely different. The message of Christ is that we would go out putting ourselves aside to serve Christ as we share him with the world. Jesus spent his ministry Not just investing in the disciples, but modeling this to us by traveling the area and sharing his good news with all who would listen. And the purpose was to make disciples of all nations. I believe as Jesus gave them this charge standing on top of the mountain as they looked out upon all the areas where they had seen Jesus minister, that they were reminded of how his ministry was one in which he was continually going where he was continually moving out and moving place to place, ministering and sharing his message. And the purpose as we move out, as we go, is to make disciples. The Greek word used here for disciples carries with it a sense of helping someone to progressively learn the word of God to become a mature and growing disciple. You see, Jesus wants us to invest in people's lives The word here has the idea of working with people over a period of time to invest in their lives with the belief that Jesus will bring them to repentance. Think about how we see Jesus live with the disciples and model this. He has personal relationships with them, long-term relationships with them, where he spends significant amount of time living life with the disciples, guiding them in his ways, teaching them, being patient with them when they make mistakes or when they don't understand what he's trying to say. And Jesus is dependable. He is always dependable for the disciples. In a similar fashion, we often use the word mentoring in this day and age to uh, denote a similar type of journeying with someone. And as followers of Christ, this should be something that we are actively engaged in, is discipling, mentoring others towards Jesus. We see the second all here in this verse as well. The message of the gospel is that we are to carry it out into the world, not just for a select group of people, 
but it's meant to be proclaimed to all. The message of hope in Jesus Christ is not just for one nation, it's not just for one ethnicity, but it is for all of humanity. Recently, my wife and I were at the Carrie Job concert that was here in Eugene, and as part of the concert, they shared uh, a ministry that they were encouraging people to give to. And I thought it was such a neat opportunity. It's called the Illuminations Ministry, and what this ministry has done, this nonprofit, is they've united the top 10 Bible translator groups all around the world in an effort to try to end Bible poverty. You see, there's still a billion people around the world who don't have the Bible in their language. And so their goal is to combine their efforts and to encourage people to partner with them so that they would see Bible poverty ended by the year 2033. You see, they believe that when Jesus says that his word is to go to all nations, that that really means all nations, that everyone would be able to read the word of God in their native tongue. And I don't know about you, but that excites me to think that that could be achieved in many of our lifetimes. 2033, that's only 10 years from now. If they're successful, every nation, every people group could have the word of God where they could read it in their tongue. What a beautiful thing to be a part of taking the message, the hope of Christ to all of the world. And I believe that this is Jesus' desire and hope. And that when he tells us to make disciples of all nations, that part of making disciples is being able to share his word and the gospel message with them in a way that they will be able to understand. In addition to sharing this with everyone and seeking to make disciples, we are to help people move along in their faith journey by baptizing them. And not in our name, not in our own ways, but we are to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, all that we do should be pointing people not to ourselves, not even to just our church, but to Jesus Christ, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is clear in his exhortation to the disciples that there is a mission that their lives are to be about. He continues in verse 20, showing them the conclusion of his calling upon their lives. Look at this last verse with me. In verse 20, he says, Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In his commentary on Matthew, scholar Dale Bruner states, First we disciple by living among people and talking with the inquiring, then by baptizing the convinced in a simple church meeting, then by teaching the baptized and ourselves an ever-increasing loyalty to Jesus' commands. You see, we are called to share our knowledge of the Bible and the commands for how we are to live as followers of Christ. Part of this is to seek out ways in which we can teach one another, where we can be doing exactly what Jesus calls us to do here, teaching them his commands. Author William Word states, The mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, but the great teacher inspires. We as Christians should inspire those around us when we teach them about who Jesus is and how he commands our lives. The apostles were given this challenge by Jesus, this charge to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. And we know that they followed through with the calling upon their lives, that they modeled living out this great commission, even to death for many of them. Look with me at Acts chapter 8, 4 through 6, and we see this coming to fruition. It tells us in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 6, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. The apostles show us throughout the remainder of the New Testament that they didn't just dismiss Jesus' instructions. They didn't just say, those are great. Let's memorize the Great Commission. Let's commit it to memory and let's continue to study it and dwell on it. And yet didn't allow it to lead to action. No, the apostles allowed it to become a core part of who they were as Jesus' followers, a core part of their understanding of what it meant to be disciples of Jesus. 
And this text from Acts shows us that they were scattered due to the persecution that they endured. But as they were scattered, they continued to go about preaching the word of Christ. And the result of their willingness to follow this exhortation from Jesus led to great joy in those cities and to changed lives. As the disciples engaged on their mission, they were to remember Jesus' closing words when he said, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, this is what their mission is rooted in. This is what our mission is rooted in. This is where our authority comes from. It's not from our strength or our power or our wisdom, but it's Jesus' presence at work within us. That when Jesus works in and through our lives and ministers through us, when we remember that he is with us always and he is the one working in us, that is when we can have true power power above all other power that can lead to lives changed for his glory. The same authority that Jesus gave his disciples is available to us today as we follow Christ. This is why we can have victory over any other power as we are indwelt by his spirit, as we seek to be obedient to his great commission. So let me challenge us this morning three ways in which we can move forward living this out in our lives. The first is that we would seek to remember his teachings. I was reading a story this week that tells that one of humanity's problems is forgetfulness. Forgetfulness can happen at multiple levels from the simple problem of recalling a posture of hard-heartedness and disobedience towards the command giver. When God deals with the people of Israel throughout the Old Testament, God does not merely say, this is God. But rather, we often read that he says, this is the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. It is a reminder to a forgetful people, which we all are often, what it is that God has done for us. C.S. Lewis reiterates this problem in his Narnian book, The Silver Chair, when Aslan teaches Jill to repeat his instructions in order that she would not forget them. Child, Aslan says, perhaps you do not see quite as well as you think, But the first step is to remember. Repeat to me in order the four signs. And like most of us, Jill soon forgets, and her and her companion's journey is forever altered. God gives us a variety of practices to remember in our lives. Sabbath, the sacraments of baptism, and the Lord's Supper, and each exists to remind us of a significant aspect of our faith and of the God who created, redeemed, and sustains us each day. So the question for all of us to answer is, will we remember? You see, if we are to follow Christ well, we must remember what he has done and what he has taught. This means that we have to put effort into this as well. Effort to read, to memorize, to internalize his teachings. Because if we don't remember what Jesus said, we will have a hard time following his instructions and his fulfilling his calling upon our lives. When we seek to remember continually what the Lord has done, it will begin to shape how we move forward in our efforts to fulfill his great commission, which will lead us to then be able to work toward his calling that we would make disciples. That's the second aspect that we must continually be about as followers of Jesus is making disciples. If you were to walk into the parking lot after church day and someone would say to you, how do I get to Bend? You would say, well, get in your car. And that's good advice, but that's just the start of it. You'd also need to say, start your car and head east on 126 and then turn and head east on Main Street and continually give them directions till they could get to where they're trying to go. These more detailed directions would see them through to the destination that they desire to go to. The beginning of evangelism is the information about Jesus Christ, how to get into him and to him, but there's much more to it. Evangelism is persuading a person to be a disciple of Christ. And that's just the beginning. That's just the first step. And then to move forward in that discipleship process. Michael Green states that 80% or more of the evangelism in the early church was done by ordinary Christians just explaining their life to friends and family. And if you look back and you study church history, that's what you see time and time again. That it was ordinary people 
willing to explain their lives to others, to friends and to family, and to share about the impact of Christ upon their lives. If we are to make disciples, as Jesus tells us to do here in Matthew, I believe that this is part of what we must be about, is that we must be about sharing and explaining why we have a hope in Jesus to others. But I think that where we must start before anything else is with prayer. Far too often we neglect prayer in our process of making disciples. And we try to do it by our own strength and our own power. We forget that Jesus reminds us that he is with us always and that that is the power we must minister in. When we start with prayer in our efforts to evangelize and make disciples, it grounds us in the Lord. It reminds us that we will not make disciples on our own, but through his power. And the second thing that we have to do is be ready to share about Jesus. Peter reminds us uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3 to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You see, each one of us who professes to be followers of Christ should be able to articulate why we follow Christ. We should be able to articulate why we have a hope in Christ, why our life is better with Christ than without Him. And we should be willing to share that with those who are around us. After we share this, we should continue to pray for those we share it with, continue to follow up, to answer their questions, to sit with them as they wrestle through questions that they may have, and to just be present in their lives. And then to help people get plugged into a local church and to come alongside them as they develop their faith. And that leads me to our last application for this text, which is that we would teach the Lord's commands. For more than 40 years, a lighthouse stood on a large peninsula jutting into the Tasman Sea in southern Australia. It stood at a place where it shouldn't have been, luring ignorant ships into the very rocks that they were trying to avoid. The cliffs around Cape St. George, just south of Jervis Bay, were notorious for shipwrecks. So it was decided that a lighthouse was needed for the safe navigation of coastal ships. And in 1857, the Colonel Architect Alexander Dawson began looking for a suitable site for the lighthouse at Cape St. George. Unfortunately, Dawson was more interested in the ease of construction rather than providing an effective navigation aid. When the pilot's board went to verify the location that he had chosen, they found that the site was not visible from the required approaches. They also found that his map suffered discrepancies so grave that it's impossible to decide whether positions marked on the map really existed. The board also suspected that Dawson chose this site solely because it was situated close to the quarry that he planned to obtain the stone from. Despite these deficiencies and disagreements by a majority of the board, for reasons unknown, the chairman of the board authorized the construction of the lighthouse. For the next four decades, the ill-sighted lighthouse was responsible for some two dozen shipwrecks. Eventually, in 1899, the lighthouse was replaced by the Point Perpendicular Lighthouse in a much more suitable location on this part of the coast. But even after its decommissioning, the lighthouse continued to cause navigational problems, especially on moonlit nights when the golden sandstone tower glowed in the dark. So near the turn of the century, the tower was reduced to rubble to prevent any further disaster. You see, if followers of Christ do not teach the Lord's commands, do not know them and be willing to teach them to others, we can often lead people to great harm. If we teach the wrong commands, if we say that Jesus taught a certain way to live and that's not what it says in Scripture, we can be like this lighthouse leading people to destruction. Initially, one may think that the idea of teaching the Lord's command sounds a lot like making disciples, and yet there is a difference as well. Teaching the Lord's commands is the next step in the journey of following Jesus and takes us to a deeper level. We are guiding people toward truth. We are ensuring that what we're guiding them toward is biblical and is founded on the truth of what Jesus says and what the word of the Lord says. Scholar Dale Bruner distinguishes this from discipleship, stating, First, we disciple by living among people and talking with the inquiring. 
then by baptizing the convinced in a simple church meeting, and then by teaching the baptized and ourselves an ever-increasing loyalty to Jesus' commands. But in order to teach the commands of Christ, we must hold to these commands in our own lives. We must know them well. It's becoming increasingly rare in our culture that the commands of Christ are at the foundation of those who say that they are followers of Christ. And yet we must stay true to the Word of God and we must stay true to teaching His commands as we see laid out in Scripture. I believe that when Jesus gave this great commission to the disciples that they would go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, that it is a challenging command and yet it is one that can be fulfilled through His power at work within us. N.T. Wright, writing about the New Testament, says, The church's unfinished task is to keep going into the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all the people. That is our calling as followers of Christ. And we can achieve this because of the victory that we have in Jesus through his resurrection. The victory that we have over any other power because of Christ at work within us. So may we as followers of Jesus go forward and share the good news of who he is. May we do it in his power and strength that work within us and for his glory alone. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with the disciples on the mountaintop, to give them this charge that we are given today as well. Lord, may we be faithful to your commands. May they be at the forefront of our mind in all that we do. Lord, may you guide us forward as we seek to be obedient to you. Thank you that you cared enough for each one of us that you have given us your word that we can know it, and that we can put it into practice in our lives. So Lord, we praise you for that. We ask that you would continue to guide and direct each one of us in your will. May you give us open eyes to see where you are moving and at work so that we can partner with you to see your kingdom come. We pray us in your matchless name. Amen.